All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nine o'clock, so let's get going. Uh, thanks for attending my Grand Rounds uh, presentation that's about uh, the management of some common plastic surgery presentations in the emergency department. And I would like to offer a warm welcome to Dr. Spencer Chambers, who will be assisting me today. Firstly, I have no financial disclosures um, or any conflicts of interest uh, regarding this or any other medical topic. However, uh, Spencer has been threatened with never getting supper again if he didn't help me. Today, I was hoping to offer a practical emergency department overview of some common plastics problems and best referral practices. My goal with this presentation is to walk through some common problems that we see, which should be done on our end, when and where and how these can be followed up in plastics, and what the patient uh, uh, gets done in clinic and thereafter. Now, please put any cases or questions that you might have in the chat and Spencer is gonna help monitor that um, and that we can address some of those at the end today. This is a non-exhaustive list of the types of hand related injuries that come through doors. Now, according to the National Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care Survey, which examined types of cases presenting to both public and private hospitals in the U.S., hand complaints represented about 12% of injury-related visits to the emergency department. Although a similar number is likely in Canada, a comparable survey has not been performed. However, hand and wrist trauma does result in a significant burden to both patients and the healthcare system um, and frequently requires referral to surgical services and potentially for surgical intervention. So to start off, can anyone tell me the uh, comp brief components of a, a hand exam? Let's go with one of our PGY1s, uh, Brandon. So look for any swelling, any erythema, atrophy, deformities. So like you said, the swan neck deformities, boot neck deformities, um, uh, any atrophy uh, deformities and any skin changes. Next, you want to check the nerve. So median, radial, and the uh, uh, ulnar nerve. And then next, uh, you, you can check for uh, any vascular compromise. So feeling if the, feeling if the radial artery is palpable or cap uh, refill. But uh, yeah, and then um, palpate for any uh, pain on uh, palpations just to look for any possible fractures. Great. So firstly, uh, some important things uh, you do want to kind of cover are the history. So what happened, how it happened, what the patient's hand dominance is, and how functional their, their uh, hand was kind of before the injury. Now getting into the physical exam stuff, general appearance uh, should include any noted deformities, any obvious foreign bodies sticking out, uh, if the part or limb looks dusky, and uh, what does the amputated portion look like if there is one? As far as circulation goes, uh, the radial ulnar as well as digital pulses should be examined. The finger is usually adequately perfused if one digital artery is patent, and as you can see from the vascular re rendering on screen right, there is a significant overlap in the hand. In most individuals, the ulnar artery provides most of the blood flow to the fingers via the superficial pulmonary branch, forming a connection with the superficial branch of the radial artery. Now, as far as sensation goes, both two-point as well as gross uh, sensation should be evaluated. An adequate sensation to the digits is ne necessary for practical use of the hand. In digital nerve injuries, these can be quite tricky to assess on initial survey because the crossover that occurs distally. Now, proximal denervation may be assessed by knowing the autonomous sensory zones uh, identified with the red dots on the diagram there here, here, and here. But for injuries in the palm or fingers, uh, two-point discrimination distal to the laceration should be tested with a paper clip bent at a five millimeter gap, um, which is the upper end of normal for sensation. If it turns out that uh, their two-point is over 15 millimeters, this is actually considered to have lost protective sensation for that digit. These uh, two-point discriminations should be done at the pulp as well as along the path of the nerve. Range of motion of the digits and wrists help to guide further evaluation. When assessing motion, a con concurrent evaluation of rotational deformities, including scissoring um, of the digits, as well as digits 
pointing away from the scaphoid during flexion. Any gross instability or laxity may be completed as well. And always compare this back to the patient's normal side. Occasionally, a full assessment of range of motion is limited by pain, and the, a local block may help to further assess these injuries. But remember that these, this should not be performed until after a thorough sensory examination has been conducted, including two-point discrimination. As far as a strength assessment goes, uh, it should be comprehensive and the areas of concern carefully evaluated for, uh, for example, to try to distinguish between mechanical weakness, like a torn or lacerated tendon, from a more proximal nerve injury resulting in muscle denervation. For more prof proximal injuries, evaluation should include motor function and testing of the exam. Uh, portion of the exam. So uh, uh, for the median nerve, for instance, it involves some abduction and opposition and is tested by making the patient make an AOK -okay sign and testing to see if you can break the ring. As far as radial nerve goes, you're testing thumb extension against resistance for the patient. And as with ulnar nerve, you're testing uh, the finger adductors. You can either do this by having the patient cross their fingers or testing against resistance. Now, as far as tendon isolation techniques go, Spence, can I borrow your hand? Mm -hmm. In the bottom picture, um, we are testing FDP. And the way that looks is you have the patient uh, palm up and you're going to stabilize both the MCP and the PIP joints. They'll be held in extension. And then you ask the patient to flex at FDP. This isolates it against from FDS. Now to test for FDS, as in the top photo, you want to um, restrict movement at the MCP, PIP, and DIP of all fingers by holding them in extension and having their palm face up. The finger that's gonna be tested is then allowed to flex at the PIP. Extensor tendons should be tested with a palm flat on a surface, and then you ask them for the finger in question to extend backwards you then can apply some resistance to test full intactness. Any ligament laxity uh, can be evaluated at essentially every joint by applying minimal force against the ligament and checking for an endpoint. If there isn't one, then you should suspect a tear. There's special considerations such as nail bed injuries and other missing tissue. Uh, as far as nail bed goes, I'm gonna be discussing this later. But for tissue loss, this can be actually quite a problem uh, for later repairs. And especially if it's over the neurovascular bundle or the tendons, as these can dry out quite rapidly. So if the patient's being sent to clinic or even if there's a delay in being seen in the emergency department, we should apply a proper dressing using moistened gauze, adaptic and cling to keep these structures from drying out. Now, imaging is a bit controversial and variable amongst our staff. However, the plastics viable, like our Rosen's, it's by Grab and Smith, they actually recommend it. Most acute hand in injuries actually require radiographic assessment uh, with a, basically a standard x-ray. And now specifically, an injury to a single digit requires a true AP and lateral of that finger particularly, which has to include the MCP, PIP, and DIP joints as well as your general hand series. However, uh, what often happens is this bulky dressing gets applied, it mashes all the fingers together, and um, it, it, those views are essentially uh, very unhelpful. Um, I'll discuss how to uh, make this a bit better later. So what are we doing when we are imaging? We're checking for things like a foreign body, bony involvement in the injury, and uh, other trauma. So even in amputation and partial amputations, uh, the bony remnants in the pieces that have been amputated need to be evaluated with x-ray. It's all well and good that uh, revascular attempts can re most of the nerves and vessels, but if there's not enough bone of adequate quality to get bony fixation, they can't put the part back on. Now, ultrasound and POCUS has been used to identify uh, foreign bodies for quite some time now. Um, and a study in 2009 by Sabu et al. demonstrated that both radiolucent and radioopaque foreign bodies could be identified with ultrasound with sensitivities between 94 and 98 percent. And they did this in a, a patient a population of 123 patients using a 7.5 megahertz uh, transducer. Our department has, uh, I believe, between um, a 3 and 13 megahertz transducer. 
This is also a great technique uh, for evaluating pulses in the uh, digits as well as at the wrist if they can't be palpated and to identify any hand abscesses or flexor tenosynovitis versus cellulitis. A study looking at this by Jardin et al. in 2008 demonstrated that formal ultrasound had a sensitivity of 94%, a specificity of 74%, with positive predictive value of 63%, and a negative predictive value of 97% for infectious Tino in the clinical diagnosis, if it was ever uncertain by physical exam alone. Now, how can we document this information to make it easy for our plastics colleagues to kind of pick up that referral and figure out how to best triage them? There's some important things to clearly and easily identify on the referral, such as identifying which hand, what level the injury is at, and what was done in the department. These includes if images were performed, if labs were done, if the patient received any antibiotics or went home on them, and then please confirm contact information as it's not uncommon that we don't do this and the patient has changed their number or there's an error in contacting them and they can't be seen in follow up. Also, it's important for us to let the patient know that the call that they're going to receive is from an unknown number, as many people will not answer the phone if that's the case. So if you're thinking about this, some things that you can write on the uh, paper as triage kind of buzzwords would be right hand extensor tendon at the metacarpal joint of the ring finger. It's not repaired, but it's been splinted. That actually um, includes pretty much everything that they would need to know and how to triage that patient appropriately. Now, this is not an exhaustive discussion of fractures and dislocations, but there's some points here that uh, can help with our reductions in the eMERGE. As far as dislocations go, they're actually associated with fractures up to 50% of the time. And so standard x-rays should be performed um, before any reductions occur. As far as DIP dislocations go, these can be treated with traction and then splinting on, on the side at which the digit was dislocated to. As far as PIP dislocations, uh, they can go dorsally, volarly, or laterally. But specifically for dorsal dislocation, which is the most common, um, these are often associated with fracture. Uh, and depending on the size of the fracture, how much it takes up, it can be stable or unstable. For these, they need traction and to be splinted in 30 degrees of flexion with the splint on the dorsum portion of uh, the digit, which allows full flexion, but limited extension. If they extend too far, they will re-dislocate. So don't put uh, the splint for these on the flexion side. It has to go on the dorsal aspect. As far as MCP dislocations go, um, you usually have simple dislocations, but these can be easily converted to complex dislocations if the volar plate, which is often torn, gets into uh, the joint space between the uh, proximal phalanx and MCP or MC head. So with this, we do not use traction. Instead, what we try to do is flex at the wrist and flex at the PIPs, relaxing the flexor tendons, and then applying pressure over the uh, proximal phalange and trying to flex it backwards over the MCP. So actually walking that dislocation down instead of pulling it out to length and down. Simply, uh, or similarly, volar dislocations happen in the exact same way and again should not be treated with traction as this can trap the extensor tendons or distal volar plates or collateral ligaments within the joint space. So again, have the patient flex at the MCPs and then as you extend the MCP, walk the uh, proximal phalanx over the MC head. For fractures at the distal phalanx, um, this is important mainly for patient uh, uh, comfort and follow-up. Um, they can often just follow up with their family doctors. It's important to note that crush injuries at the tip, um, there's certain things that, that patients should be aware of. Um, up to 50% uh, have non-union of their tuft fractures at six months. And often in crush injuries, they'll have cold and pressure sensitivity out to years afterwards, which will often result in multiple return visits to both their primary care physician as well as the emergency department. These should be treated in an extension splint um, at, and be immobilized at the DIP for two to three weeks. And what the intent there is to try to prevent a bony mallet from forming. 
as for proximal and middle uh, phalange fractures, uh, these have kind of similar properties. Um, they can all be uh, a bit tricky to reduce, but trying to reduce angulation here is kind of the, the key. As well, when you do reduce it, you should make sure that you're derotating it if there is a rotation rotational deformity and buddy taping that to the finger beside it um, prior to putting it into a splint. And then you can cast it in the intrinsic plus position, which I'll discuss on the next slide. If there is a non-displaced shaft fracture um, of your proximal or middle phalanx, these can be buddy taped to the uninjured finger beside it. Now, as far as metacarpal uh, fractures go, this is actually uh, accounting for 40% of all hand fractures distal to the carpals, and that these mainly happen in young men. Uh, metacarpal neck fractures, which is the most common, uh, often referred to as a boxer's fracture, particularly when it occurs over uh, the fourth and fifth digit. Reduction um, is uh, described on the slide, and I'm going to have Spencer uh, discuss how to properly reduce it. Yeah, like I'm there right here. Okay. So this is just somewhat of a trick if you have a metacarpal neck fracture or a metacarpal head fracture, because it's usually very hard, or I find it hard anyway, to get direct pressure underneath while holding a third point back here. And this takes advantage of some of the mechanics of the metacarpal joint. So everyone can try this on themselves. If you're extended, you've got a lot of play in that joint versus when you flex, things tighten up and there's much less play. That's because the head of the metacarpal is actually ovoid or non-concentric. So when you flex, you're essentially tightening the ligaments to control, and in that way, you can use the proximal phalanx to push up on the head. Similarly, you can do this. It's a little bit different biomechanically, but for head of the proximal phalanx or even head of the middle phalanx, and it just gives you something to hold on to. Now, the angulation of these fractures, uh, the degree to which uh, exists is is kind of debatable. Um, it is said that up to 30% uh, angulation is uh, acceptable after reduction, and any thereafter does require surgical management, but this is very different depending on the finger that you're discussing. Now, this is that 10, 20, 30, 40 rule that discusses how much angulation is allowed to, to be persistent after reduction. Oh, and please always get post-reduction x-rays. That's one of the most common things that doesn't happen um, in the plastics clinic thereafter, so they have no idea what it looks like after we've reduced it. Now, as far as uh, splinting and casting goes, uh, make sure to include the joint above and below. In the distally, you can use uh, stack splints for mallets um, and make sure that they never come off uh, until they are followed up in clinic, as well as uh, tough fractures for comfort. And in, in these injuries, um, they're good for the aluminum splints. Middle and proximal uh, fractures can be treated with buddy taping plus or minus the intrinsic plus splints demonstrated on the screen left. That's the positioning that you want the patient in with wrist uh, slightly extended at 30 degrees, your metacarpals at 80 to 90 degrees, and the PIP and DIP is in full extension. As far as metacarpal fractures, again, using intrinsic plus splints with at least three points of fixation around the fracture, such as an ulnar gutter. Boxers fractures can be immobilized in the same way. And when it comes to fractures in the thumb, spikas are your kind of go-to casting. Now, there is often unstable fractures in the thumb. And so when you apply the cast, you often have to re-reduce the, the thumb in the cast to make sure that it holds. Um, and that's not uncommon. Now, we've all heard the phrase, just tack it closed and send a clinic. And I'm going to be discussing why that actually makes a lot of sense for some of uh, the more common injuries. As for tendons, Camel and Yao performed a meta-analysis of 39 studies in 2017 and found that surgical management had good outcomes for repairs within the first three weeks. Although in animal models, acute repair is best at time zero, in the clinical studies, there was no significant difference noted between earlier or later repairs as long as it was done within that time limit. Now, after this three weeks, the tendon ends become distorted, the sheath will scar down, the muscle tendon unit can shorten and adhesions will form, making primary repair essentially impossible. As for nerve repair, regaining meaningful function, including sensory and motor, is always going to be a challenge. And according to a meta-analysis by Ruiz at all in 20, 
or 2009 out of Oxford University, evaluating ulnar and median nerve injuries, patient age, mechanism, and the gap is actually much more important in surgical outcomes than delayed a surgery of up to three months. Now, they did find that between three to six weeks, all having equivalent outcomes as time zero. Similarly, uh, I doctor named, uh, or surgeon named Slutsky in 2014 from California performed a meta-analysis of the various types of nerve grafts and outcomes associated with those, demonstrating that success surgeries were those that would return 2.8 to millimeters or less and were impacted more by patient factors than the time to surgery, with some grafts being possible out to 190 days post-injury with similar functional outcomes. Interestingly, however, uh, a more recent systematic review of 30 different studies, mainly retrospective case studies, uh, all were performed by uh, uh, Dunlap in uh, 2018. This is again out of the uh, UK, and they found that the evidence supporting digital nerve repair in adults is actually completely lacking. Uh, now, they quoted that the return of normal sensibility is uncommon, and almost all unrepaired nerves regain some protective sensation by six months. And at, all, at that time, all patients declined further surgery, and that there was no difference in the outcomes. Roughly 25% of patients regained uh, normal two-point discrimination. And at the time to repair, that was rarely identified in the studies as an important outcome, as long as the time was less than three months. Current guidelines almost unanimously suggest that uh, surgical intervention for open fractures occur all, pretty much immediately. However, those in the hand don't really came to carry the same weight of evidence that the recommendation of long bone fractures would. Many studies actually support surgical evaluation within 24 hours and all identify our initial emergency department management as the most important factor with copious irrigation and antibiotics. A study uh, by Bassat et al. in 2017 out of Israel performed a retrospective review, review that evaluated the relationship between the level of contamination, the quality of the washout in the emergency room using a 20cc syringe for pressure, and the development of infection. It included 61 patients with open fractures to the hand who were washed out in their merge with rates of infection of 14.8%. 7% of these fractures were listed as being quite contaminated on their chart. The infection rate was not related to the type, fracture type, the finger involved, the hand dominance, or patient comorbidities. And all were actually soft tissue infections. Only one patient went on to develop osteomyelitis. Now, the factors that did impact infection rates were the volume of irrigation with a p-value of 0.047 and antibiotic choice with a p-value of 0.39, with cefazolin outperforming clavulin. Now, those who received the course of cefazolin actually had a, a reduced uh, infection rate at 10.5% in the subgroup analysis for antibiotics. So they recommend a dose of IV uh, ANCEF followed by two week course of PO Keflex. Irrigation should have at least a thousand cc's and patients should be seen in clinic within the week. As for fingertip injuries, Lemon et al. in 2008 laid out a pretty reasonable algorithmic approach to fingertip injuries with the following considerations in mind. The goals of treatment for revision amputation or other treatments are providing durable coverage, preserving sensation and length, minimizing discomfort, and expediting return to work or leisure. Now, interestingly, soft tissue defects less than uh, 1.5 centimeters squared at the pulp, so kind of right in here, can be, uh, even if there's bone exposed, uh, can be treated just with dressings and will heal by secondary intention. Once outside the pulp though, or when there's significant loss of tissue, plastics needs to be involved to make management decisions regarding either revision amputation, reattachment, or the possibility of local advancement flaps. Now replantation is possible with good results at the level of the nail fold to DIP, but this is more commonly practiced in Asian countries due to the cultural practices. In North America, Replantation usually is considered at a more proximal level, but is, this is really a discussion between the patient and the PRS team. To help them out, however, we can ensure that we document and work up the patient as follows. So determine when, how, and by what the part was amputated. Rem remembering that cold ischemia time is not set in stone, and time to replant can actually be up to days as there's many case reports that say so. 
Warm ischemia time, however, is only six hours. So storage of the part is actually key. We should clean the amputated part with normal saline, wrap it up in a dampened sponge, put that part in a bag, and then put that bag on ice. We should never be putting the part directly in the bag of ice as the ice is gonna melt and now you have a bit that's floating around in a tiny cesspool and I can't honestly say when the last time our ice machine was cleaned. Radiographs again should be performed to help guide management as mentioned, that if there's not good bone in the part that's been annotated, they'll never get bony fixation and it's not worth putting back on. It can sometimes have a delay between the when the patient enters the emergency department to when they're actually being seen. So if we are performing local blocks for comfort, um, they ask us not to use epinephrine as this can influence the blood supply to the distal portions and impact the ability for replantation. One of the most kind of uh, uh, common and confusing injuries that we see is subungal hematomas and nail bed crush injuries. Despite how common these are, there's not really good evidence to support um, you know, what the best management practices are, and therefore this is often less to, left to providers' discretion. Uh, there's a spectrum of injuries here to the distal phalanx, including tough fractures, nail plate disruption, nail matrix laceration, partial or complete amputation. So what should we be doing? There's some literature that suggests removing the nail and ensuring the underlying lacerations when the hematoma is greater than 25 to 50%, especially if there's an underlying fracture. However, that is kind of based off of this one study which influenced everything at the time it was written. And um, they didn't even have a control group and more importantly, they never followed up these patients for their outcomes to explain their decision making and instead just decided to guide care that way. More recently, however, there has been a, a more reasonable approach documented that involves trephination, regardless of if there's a fracture, um, including uh, even pretty large hematomas uh, with similar rates of infection, nail abnormalities, and patient outcomes. Now, this study has been duplicated multiple times with similar results and favors trephination with large hematomas, regardless if there's a fracture underneath. Now, the only caveats to this approach is when the nail matrix has been entrapped in the fracture, leading to a delayed union or possible intraosseous inclusion cysts, um, and this is similar to what happens in a Seymour fracture, which is a, a childhood fracture involving the growth plate. Uh, Spence is going to explain this a little bit. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so I, I always think nails are kind of an interesting discussion because there's a lot written about it for being such a small thing, and there's no real consensus. And as Patrice said, a lot of the discussion comes from do you take the nail off or not, and that's from one paper from like the 70s of one guy who had terrible follow-up. But in general, I think you have to convince yourself that taking the nail off to repair the nail bed will be a good thing and you'll be able to fix more trauma than you cause by doing that. The only caveat to that is in kids specifically, because usually you see the situation where a kid gets his finger stuck in a door and he has this slip or this Salter Harris style fracture where the distal phalanx slips off the growth plate. And when that happens, the nail matrix underneath tends to to tear a bit more proximally and then that will become draped over that distal phalanx into the fracture site. So when you reduce it, you end up interposing that nail matrix into the fracture site and then you get an issue where you have a non-healing wound and potentially osteomyelitis in that case. So in those kids, even though the nail might look okay and it might be adherent, those would be ones I would take off, investigate the fracture site and pull it out and then repair that and put the nail back. And that also it's a different story and that's more use your judgment, but kids, I have a lower threshold. And then just a note on this slide, this is from our textbook and I don't know why they did this, but in the lower right picture when they use nylon, if at all possible, use an absorbable stitch just because these are terrible for the patient to come out and I don't know why this made it into the textbook. Okay, can anyone tell me what Cannavale's signs are? Let's go with Emily. Sorry, could you just repeat the question? What signs? Cannavale signs. I'm not sure, sorry. 
that's okay. So they're uh, um, the kind of classic signs that uh, are supposed to indicate flexor tenosynovitis. Uh, these include fusiform swelling, a, a hand that's held in flexion, pain with passive extension, and pain on palpation over the tendon. Now, pyrogenic flexor tenosynovitis is a closed space hand infection uh, within the actual tendon sheath. And even with early recognition and treatment, it has a complication rate as high as 38%, often leaving piece, people with continued pain, uh, stiffness, and swelling, as well as the possibility of recurrence, which could require amputation. It accounts for up to 9% of all hand infections. And although it's not common, it's not rare either. Our concern for it, however, is far more common. Now, if we truly think about these signs, um, it, it, they were invented by Alan B. Canaval in 1912 in his first public, published textbook. And it wasn't until 1928 that penicillin, the first true antibiotic, was discovered by Alexander Fleming. So when Carnival actually wrote his signs about superta flexor tino, it had a natural history that was often leading to systemic infections, amputations, and even death. But with the advent of antibiotic therapy, the incidence of catastrophic sequelae associated with flexor tino has actually decreased dramatically. Now, the sensitivity of Canaval signs has been routinely studied over the years and are still considered 91 to 97% sensitive. However, their specificity is only somewhere between 50 and 70%. Although when you do discuss flexor tenosynovitis with our surgical colleagues, the most sensitive sign that Canaval actually never attributed to it was tenderness over the A1 pulley that quickly drops off as you palpate more proximally. Now, blood work can be helpful. It does offer a good uh, positive predictive value, but just like other infections we see offers absolutely no negative predictive value. Non-operative treatments for flexor tino can be appropriate in those who present early, typically within the first 48 hours after the penetrating trauma to the hand. Now, during this non-operative window, the affected hand should be monitored frequently. If the treatment is going to be successful, you should have clinical symptom improvement within 20 to 4 to 48 hours. And if not, symptoms uh, uh, get getting worse or staying the same, surgical intervention should then be indicated. The problem here, though, is with the diagnosis itself. Um, it's clinically hard, and patients can often have normal blood work, but a significantly swollen finger. So as I previously mentioned, POCUS can actually help us uh, um, making these kind of final determinations of whether or not we actually think it's flexor tino. I've already discussed the Jardin study, but a second study that evaluated um, uh, emergency physicians using POCUS at bedside was performed by Hubbard in 2018. They actually looked at the diagnosis of flexor tino in patients who had two, at least two kind of signs and showed quite favorable and successful results at diagnosing in all seven patients that were identified. Frank was actually kind enough to provide me with uh, some images that they've acquired over the years of uh, hand infections. Now, if you look at these first two clips, you can see in the bottom right normal tendon sliding underneath. This is actually an abscess in the soft tissues above the tendon, and this is cobblestoning that exists kind of in the same area. However, you can see the tendon itself is not involved. This would still give you a large swollen finger that can be very painful to palpate. These, on the other hand, demonstrate fluid within the tendon sheath. You can see the tendon running here, surrounded by a decent amount of fluid, less so on this side, but this is also quite suspicious when you can see the tendon moving back and forth, surrounded by fluid. Other hand infections include deep space hand infections in the palmar, thenar, and peronis space. That's the potential space between the pronator quadratus and flexor tendons. You can have collar button abscesses or web space abscesses that form beneath the palmar calluses and often penetrate through one of the three web spaces. You can also have radial bursa or ulnar bursa infections, all of which POCUS can help identify. Now on to burn management. This is not meant to be an exhaustive burn talk and, and more or less just kind of the initial steps with some important pearls on how to communicate and utilize our PRS teams. The burn classification system has kind of moved away from your traditional first, second, and third degree nomenclature and 
uh, provides a more physiologic classification with superficial thickness, partial thickness, superficial versus deep, and full thickness burns. Interestingly, the Lund-Browder diagram is actually much better at uh, predicting instead of the rule of nines, which is something that we are more accustomed to. This diagram discusses how that uh, actually is used um, to predict per total TBSA and has a higher accuracy of prediction and greater interradial reliability than the rule of nines ever can. As far as inhalational injuries, these should be considered in any patient that has been exposed to a confined space, even for a brief time. Inhalation injuries would be rare in a patient in an open setting unless their face was actually on fire. And the mortality of inhalational injuries between 10 and 30%, these increase drastically the greater the TBSA burn. Now there's many formulas out there that involve uh, fluid goals and how resuscitation should be happening. Uh, you can use them as at your discretion, and I'm not going into the evidence of, of all of um, the different ones available, but I do think it's reasonable to maintain a urine output as your target. So aiming for an hourly output between 30 and 50 cc's in adults and between 0.5 and 1 cc per kilogram in children. Antibiotics are not necessary up front and should not be given prophylactically for burns. Tetanus, however, should be. Now, as for airway, this is something that's more at our discretion, but there's no real good data on prediction, and it, it awfully is, it's often oversensitive and not very specific when it comes to deciding. Now, while it is critical to anticipate impending airways uh, for compromise and consider securing them sooner rather than later, the systematic review suggests that one third of burn patients are actually unnecessarily intubated in the emergency department. And signs such as singed nasal hair or facial burns alone are not indications for intubation. Mild inhalational injuries in patients with otherwise normal oxygenation saturations uh, and no signs of respiratory stress can often just be safely monitored. Some indications for early intubation, however, are your signs of rest distress, strider, accessory muscle use, new or onset hoarseness, blisters or edema within the oral pharynx itself, or deep burns to the lower face and neck. A lot of our burns come in uh, with concomitant trauma, fractures uh, existing in 50 to 60% of these patients. There's often traumatic brain injuries in up to a quarter, and up to 25% uh, have some form of thoracic or intra-abdominal trauma. Now, while we're waiting for our PRS team to help us make decisions regarding the burns, we should be initially applying dressings and not just allowing them to kind of sit out to open air and dry out. Important information for the PRS team um, when we do discuss with them is the patient's current status, including their hemodynamics, and if their airway has been taken or not, the size of the burn, the approximate breakdown, its location, and the existence of any circumferential burns or other special considerations included like burnt genitalia. The mechanism of the burn and any other concomitant trauma that exists. Now, LHSC does still take surgical burns that are greater than 20%, but this is really at the discretion of the staff and the resources identified at the time, and it's completely up to PRS. If greater than 30%, the PRS team assesses and will be involved with transfer discussions to any other burn center. If it's less than 20% of a surgical burn, however, uh, PRS should be involved uh, soon as they can help direct care. And if there's airway concerns or the patient's intubated, they should be going to CCTC. If there's concomitant trauma, they should be going under the trauma team. Otherwise, the PRS is happy to be involved in the care and direction of this patient. Looking at how we refer to their burn clinic that happens once a week, uh, a recent retrospective review actually performed by Spencer for this burn clinic uh, looked at the appropriateness of the patients that were referred. Now we're doing a great job, but if anything, we're overly cautious that, with those who are sent. 90% of those patients referred did meet the American Association burn criteria, but again, these criteria are awfully overcautious. Of the 246 patients over a two-year period, the average time to follow up was six days. At first visit, 127 of these people had healed completely at the first visit, and this is mainly kids and hand burns, and only 15 people went on to acquire surgical debridement or other intervention, and this is mainly in the elderly populations. 
So if we're planning to discharge a burn with or without referral to their outpatient clinic, the things we should be thinking of is that dressings should be changed daily. When they clean them, they can shower using soap and water and then reapplying a petroleum-based salve as well as a, a daptic and cling. CCAC can be referred if the patient does not think they should, could be able to do this themselves. And analgesia, particularly around the time of dressing changes, is very much required, usually with, for the first three to five days, and then can be stepped down thereafter. On to facial trauma. Your standard head and neck exam usually includes a brief airway assessment, if needed, and includes things like appearance, uh, lacerations, deformities, swelling, bruising, bleeding. Um, and if there's uh, any concern, look in the ears, nose, and mouth, depending on the type of injury. And always check the hair, palpate the face, the scalp, the scalp, the skull, and the neck, as well as performing your basic cranial nerve exam. Uh, there is a, a bit more of a detailed explanation that Spencer is going to describe in his kind of top down approach. So I think facial fractures, there's just a lot. And then the big confusing thing is that radiology will read these scans and they read it anatomically, but not necessarily in a useful way. Similar to when they comment on abdomen, they talk about cysts here and there. There's a similar concept for face. But the basis of my craniofacial exam is always something similar to what you would do in terms of a head and neck exam and cranial nerve exam. And then when I think about specific questions or specific things I look for, I break the face into thirds. And then I have particular things associated with each of those fractures. So the upper third would be frontal sinus, uh, lower third would be mandible, and then the middle third I say for last because it's most complicated, there's just most structures. And then I try to remember the fractures based on this. So as I said, upper third is a frontal sinus, lower third is a mandible, and then the middle thirds, there's about five inches in obviously nasal bone fractures, mid-face fractures like the forts, uh, ZMCs and orbital floors most commonly. So as I'm doing my top-down approach showing palpation, sensation, et cetera. I just think about specific things. So for the orbital floor, you think about extraocular movements, obviously looking for something like entrapment or changes in visual acuity. Uh, and these are something you think about bleeding and if the patient's on blood thinners or not. As I go through the mid-face, I want to look at their teeth because that's really why we fix the fort fractures and you want to know that their occlusion is normal or if their mid-face is unstable. Uh, ZMCs, you think about things like trismus because if you collapse in the arch enough, it can pinch on uh, the muscles of mastication, making it difficult to open their mouth, and that'd be a functional reason for intervention. NOEs are something that's somewhat of a difficult thing to pick up, but on physical exam, you can note that the eyes are asymmetric, or there's telecanthus, and that's a little bit different because often you'll have someone that comes with a nasal bone style fracture, but it's a little bit different, and NOEs are always operative versus nasal bones often will reduce and then fix secondarily in nine to 12 months down the road. And then nasal fractures, the other thing you always think about looking for is uh, septal hematoma, all of that's more or less a pediatric phenomenon, although it's in the literature. Now, as far as some other things to consider on the facial exam, there is something called a, a danger triangle, um, mainly in regards to infection. This consists of the area between uh, uh, the corners of the mouth and the bridge of the nose and includes the nose and maxilla. Why this is important is that venous drainage in this area actually forms a communication with the brain via, via the superior and inferior ophthalmic veins, which empty into the cavernous sinus, potentially creating um, uh, for facial infections to spread to the brain, causing serious complications, including meningitis, intracranial abscess, uh, seizure, coma, death. As for uh, nerve lacerations uh, and, and considerations with that, you do have these danger zones that are, are uh, described kind of for uh, different nerve areas. Now, this was well described in an article by Seckel um, as these need to be considered with any laceration and the resulting nerve uh, injuries that could be distal to the laceration site. Now, the trajectory of the facial nerve and its branch and its branches is important. This is that to Zanzibar by motor car, including your temporal, zygomatic, buccal, mandibular, and cervical branches. Now in these zones, nerve injury is likely depending on the wound depth, especially lateral to the lateral canthus. If medial to this, there's often enough arborization from uh, the superior and inferior branches that it won't uh, cause uh, significant paralysis for the patient, but laterally it definitely can. Sometimes the trauma itself is, is just too severe for us to, to do proper exams, particularly of the eye, which is very important to assess up front. Now, while awaiting the facial scan, there is another way to do it. Looking for entrapment um, uh, on a uh, pocus, 
looking at, particularly at the extraocular movements. And if those are intact and not painful, entrapment is very unlikely. Facial function is the most important predictor of whether a facial fracture is actually operative or not, followed by cosmetics. Function includes eating, breathing, and seeing. The patient's ability to eat is impacted by things such as malocclusion, trismus, and dentition. Breathing is impacted by nasal structure and shape, soft tissue, as well as bone. And vision depends on the shape of the orbit and the ability of the muscle and soft tissue to be supported and fixated. Now, we all know where the big bad ones go specifically the Laforts, but who else is involved in facial fractures and fixing them? So firstly, plastic surgery sees everything. Ophthalmology, they don't fix any facial fractures. OFMS, they mainly do mandibles, but recently have started to try to do most things below the orbits. ENT needs to be involved in temporal bones, particularly because of concern for facial nerveries, plus or minus neurosurgery, depending on the level of a, a temporal bone fracture. And neurosurgery needs to be involved in any other skull fractures, as well as frontal sinus fractures. Now, what gets fixed? As we mentioned, nasal bones, even open fractures, can often just be tacked, closed, and sent to clinic, unless they're particularly dirty. Sometimes these do require antibiotics, but often not. The jaw will often be managed sooner due to pain alone. Tripod fractures are surgical, but usually just cosmetic um, as it's a, a pretty big coronal incision that has to happen to fix these. So this is a big discussion with patient. The lamina propitia, uh, which is what I call leaf paper, these are never operative, but will break in like with every single facial fracture that exists. Orbital floor, uh, mostly non-operative, some vision changes would sway that. Um, and entrapment is always, always, always pediatric phenomenon. Spencer will explain this. Oh, okay. So in every single textbook it's ever written about any craniofacial exam, there's always this consensus or this fear that the one surgical emergency is entrapment of the inferior rectus. And then all the clinical signs they point to are impossible to assess in a patient because they've been punched in the eye, so they're swollen. You can't necessarily get great range of motion out of them for a number of reasons. But the actual pathophysiology of that is when you get an orbital floor, the eyeball pops back and breaks out the orbital floor, which is the thickness of eggshell in adults. And when it happens, it typically breaks and is open. For that, you imagine an open hole and even a very large orbital floor, it's even more difficult for the muscle to become interposed or caught on the fracture. But this is different in kids. So although kids have thin bone as well, they've got very, very thick perichondrium or periosteum. And for that reason, they green stick. So the same floor breaks, something falls in, and then the floor snaps back up. These have interesting CT findings where you'll have a totally intact oral floor and then you'll have some below it. And these kids are very, very classic in terms of they can't look up. Oftentimes they've got significant nausea and vomiting and they've got significant discomfort and pain. Very uncommon. And I've seen one in my residency, Dr. Maddock would agree that it's typically not seen in adults, but that doesn't mean if you're unsure, don't call us. But it would just be uncommon is what I would say or less common than what the textbooks would allude to. Thanks. So some hints for uh, uh, lids, lips, and ears. Um, using blocks, if possible, make the repair actually much easier as you can uh, get approximate anatomy and not distort kind of local tissue and shape, which makes your um, uh, laceration repair much easier. So in the ear, using a ring block around, as well as lips uh, doing infraorbital or mental blocks. Um, Importantly, choosing uh, which stitches you're gonna use. Uh, so for lips, you should, uh, be using mainly absorbable. Proline's okay for skin, but muscle, vermilion, and cutaneous, as well as mucosal, can all be closed with absorbable. Ears, uh, for cartilage, you can put one or two stitches in the cartilage if it's unstable. Otherwise, just close the skin. You can use absorbable or proline. There is different, op different opinions with this, uh, but consider antibiotics if the wound was in ever way dirty, uh, specifically cerbifloxacin. With lids, uh, using proline or fast gut, um, and then leaving long trails so that these can actually be taped out of the eyes way. Now, if there's no emergent need for intervention or other reason for admission, uh, home management for many facial fractures is appropriate. All fractures should be sleeping with the head of the bed elevated and using ice to help reduce swelling. Analgesics with Tylenol and Advil are often enough. Anything around the teeth to use a soft diet is quite reasonable, although patients with mandibular and maxillary fractures are rarely sent home given this reason. 
Antibiotics are almost never indicated. Um, there is literature out there to say penicillins for open mandibles might be warranted, but this is not an absolute fact. Now on to some of the things that we term snakes in the grass. Ring avulsion injuries uh, occur when a patient gets their ring or other object wrapped around their finger uh, caught. It's usually in a machine and that, that's suddenly pulled away. This injury can range from a laceration to soft tissue degloving to complete amputation. The injury results from shearing of the tissues and often goes down to bone, potentially completely compromising the neurovascular status of the digit. Uncommon, but a devastating injury, and the bad cases are quite obvious, but more moderate ones can appear just as simple lacerations. Diagnosis is based solely on history and exam uh, of your neurovascular status. Now, things in history that should tip us off are any injuries involving a ring or other object wrapped around the digit, and a mechanism that involves a sudden forceful movement away from the patient. So some examples of this would be uh, someone working with their hand down in an engine, uh, wearing their wedding ring, and then someone startled them and they tried to pull their hand back really quickly, but it got stuck. Or someone um, holding a keychain with their finger through the loop and then trying to go unlock the door and someone pulling away the door very quickly. Nasal orbital ethmoid fractures or NOE fractures that Spencer alluded to earlier. Uh, these are, are fractures involving the area of confluence of the nose orbit ethmoids, the base of the frontal sinus and the floor of the anterior cranial base. And this area includes the insertion of the medial canthin tendon, which is why you'll get that telecanthus if it's broken. NOE fractures by definition are a different entity than isolated nasal bone fractures. However, they are often associated with fractures of the nasal bone and on occasion can be mistaken for just simple nasal bone fractions, fractures due to the edema and soft tissue distortion secondary to it. Frontal sinus. Other injuries are to the nasal lacrimal duct in the area, as well as you can get uh, cerebral spinal fluid rhinorrhea if the fracture goes through the cribriform plate. Approximately 60% of NOE fractures are associated with orbital fractures, and approximately 20% are diagnosed with pain or with pan facial smashes. Isolated NOEs uh, account for approximately 5% of all facial fractures in adults and up to 16% in kids. Now, the main thing on physical exam, as we mentioned, is this uh, evidence of telecanthus, so uh, increased distance between the eye uh, at the bridge of the nose. And now, although nasal bone fractures are rarely operative, these ones always are. And lastly, uh, similar to ring involution injuries, high pressure injection injuries uh, can look relatively benign. These can lead to big problems later on though, and usually require surgical debridement. High pressure injection injuries appear as these innocuous little punctate wounds, but uh, they often occur in laborers using tools, um, but they present with minimal pain resulting in misinterpretation and of the severity of the injury. So as you can see on the screen, there's a gentleman with a, a small little injury to his hand, which later on went to require debridement of his entire forearm, given the material uh, made it all the way that far, uh, given that pressure of the system. On average, one of 600 hand traumas are these high pressure injection injuries and usually it involves um, a laborer uh, involved in industrial cleaning with painting, lubricants, or fueling, and they, they're awfully sustained when the operator attempts to clean the nozzle. Now, you can get uh, um, skin break at a little, as, as little as 100 PSI. Now, the force of the injection actually leads to dissection along planes, which is why these can get so deep, and it usually uh, goes down the path of least resistance, which is around the neurovascular bundle. This again lead to vascular compression and compromise. Caustic injuries in there uh, can often cause internal fat necrosis and inflammatory responses. Now, if the digit or limit limb was happened to survive these phases, secondary infection is very likely to result. And as such, we should actually prophylactically uh, cover with broad spectrum antibiotics up front. So the last leg of this is kind of discussing how to use plastic sur surgery in the hospital system. So what can stay uh, at UH? All hand injuries distal to the carpets can stay and can be referred on paper to UH Plastics. The UH team will then triage these paper referrals and send them where they see fit. All wrist and proximal injuries go to ortho and it's ortho's job to triage these to Hulk. What goes to Hulk straight from us? 
carpal injuries. Paper referrals go to Hulk and on the agreement of the ortho team, but if anything needs to be seen or assessed that day, call the UH ortho team and they will see and possibly say call Hulk. Currently during COVID times, um, everything operative is being transferred to Hulk, um, but if it needs to be seen in the eMERGE that day, just call the plastics team. But this isn't our job to triage that. They will do that when, when they get there. As far as who goes to VIC, any pediatric hand goes to plastic if it's distal to the carpal row, and anything uh, above that goes to uh, peds ortho. At, at VIC, all pediatric hand injuries will stay there. Now, there is some rules in the city about if they're over 15 and they're operative, they can go to Hulk, but that's really not for us to be worried about. Our paper referrals will go to VIC Plastics and they send them where they need to go. Anything distal to the carpus is always ortho. It's ortho's job to triage these and get proximal. them to Hulk, or sorry, proximal to the uh, carpal row um, and get them to Hulk if needed. Complex hand trauma will often go to Hulk. Uh, the paper referrals, again, we can still send to the VIC team and they will triage and refer as they see fit. Now, what stays at Joe's? Um, importantly, and how to use their teams. So if there's a breast issue, a craniofacial issue, or a burn, call the plastics team specifically at Joe's. If it's elbow and shoulder, call the ortho team. And if it's hand, call the Hulk pager, which should actually be named the hand pager, because yeah, these are all different. And the Hulk pager is covered by rotating teams of ortho and plastics, but they deal with hands that day. Otherwise, if there's any other kind of uh, uh, advanced level of care or admission required, the patient will be sent down to VIC. If there's peds or pregnant ladies, they also go to VIC. Now, as far as surgical infections and specifically necrotizing infections, um, there is in works of a document of how to get these patients to the most appropriate service based on anatomical site. And as you can see here, there's gonna be a lot of moving parts. Um, specifically, plastics will see anything on the hand and upper limb and that it's broken down uh, uh, by area kind of thereafter. Similarly, acute on chronic wounds are kind of treated in the same way. It's a bit tougher of a question, but in general, uh, it depends on whether or not if it's making them sick or not. And if it's a post-operative source or if the wound is gonna be tr treated uh, the same as an infected wound would. These patients after, often have other medical concerns going on and therefore medicine is going to be the primary service. But if nothing, absolutely nothing else is going to be keeping them in hospital, then it goes to the surgical service. Really part of this is who made the wound and they are the ones that should be following it up. CCAC uh, and family medicine can follow these in the community with dressing care discussions and plastics usually will see all wounds in all places if they're chronic. If, if these are operative in any way, then the uh, people who made the wound should be called first. Again, I would like to thank Spence and Dr. Komorowski for his help and Dr. Aaron Grant for his oversight and the lease of his resident. Um, and I leave you with pictures of my other helper throughout residency, Sir Winston Churchill. If you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. Dr. Grant's here too. He's been answering questions in the chat. Oh, sweet. And Dr. Grant's here too. He's been answering questions in the chat. Hey, Dr. Grant. Hey. Does anyone have anything burning that they want to discuss? Patrice, it's John. Just a, a couple of a couple of comments. Um, when you were talking about preserving evulsed fingertips and you know uh, body pieces um, just one slight addition um, what uh, I've always been taught to do is to to obviously clean the piece um, wrap it in damp gauze saline yes. silk gauze put it in a plastic bag and then put it in an ice bath rather than on ice directly because that way you'll avoid freezing the part but you'll keep it at zero degrees I think that's so, fair. I, I think the, the main take home point is it's got to be cool and not frozen because you yeah. can imagine if you put like any digit, whether it's attached or not, in an ice bucket for six hours, it'll get frostbite. So what happens in those, if we put it back on, they get blistering and that sort of thing afterwards because there's been some sort of direct cellular injury. But however you want to accomplish keeping it cool but not frozen, and I, I think that's a great way as well. Yeah, Doctor, I, think, I, I, think the, I think the point is that if you put it in an ice bath, it cannot freeze. 
um, if you put it on ice, it can freeze. So mm -hmm. that's that's the difference. Uh, the only other co the com uh, just a comment about um, splinting of of hands and fingers in general. I'd be interested in Dr. Grant's comments on this. Um, uh, I find that when patients have splints put on the volar aspect of their hand, uh, that they uh, they're not as well tolerated as when you put them on the dorsum. Um, and so you spoke a couple of times about specific types of injuries that you would put a dorsal splint on them. Um, but I find that for most things, I mean, you may want to have, may, I mean, in some cases you're, you're wanting to um, put the patient in the wrist and extension and so on and, uh, uh, and the fingers in, in flexion at the MCP joints, uh, fair enough. But so uh, if you're just splinting the fingers themselves, then I wonder about, uh, particularly near the fingertips, whether the dorsal splint is in fact uh, better. Um, and, and at the same time, maybe he could comment on um, uh, the use of a different type of splint for the mallet finger rather than a stack splint, which again, interferes with the function of the finger uh, and the, uh, the use of the tactile surface of the injured finger. If you put, take a, a small paper clip, wrap it in, um, um, in tape and put a slight um, bend in it, so it's convex downwards uh, onto the, the dorsum of the finger uh, and tape that over that distal joint, the DIP joint. Uh, I find that actually works quite well, but I'm not sure if the, that's uh, approved by uh, the plastics community. Um, yeah, I think uh, two things. I think we, you're right, sometimes those splints that you have in Emerge, the prefabricated splints um, are a little bit uncomfortable volarly because you're only splinting the finger and then the metal jabs in sort of to the, uh, to the proximal palm and things. So sometimes those ones can be sort of a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and so if you are putting them dorsally, um, you can certainly do that and secure them uh, with cling or tape or, or what have you. We, uh, to be honest, in, in our hand clinics, when we have our therapist, we mold uh, thermoplastic splints to uh, mold it. And we, we uh, probably more preferentially do volar, but, but of course they are uh, molded to the patient's hand. So um, I think sometimes for the prefabricated splints, uh, especially those little blue ones with the metal and foam on them, they are a little bit more comfortable sort of dorsally. Um, and there's no problem with that because hopefully they'll be seen sort of within our clinic and have a, a better splint, you know, within two weeks. So hopefully that should be okay. So I would say whatever is more comfortable and works and certainly dorsal splints are, uh, uh, can function well. The, uh, thing about mallet uh, injuries is um to be honest it's uh until we get them in clinic and either and get a again a thermoplastic splint we tend to use sort of stack splints but again they're they're sort of molded uh with a little bit of hyper extension uh we can't get any any of those prefabricated stack splints to um mold that well they have different sizes but of course you know with swelling it changes and everything so with the amount of swelling and things early on i think as long as they're splinted in extension so that they can't bend that dip joint um, until they get sort of to our clinic, then that is sufficient. I've never heard of the uh, paper clip, but um, as long as it doesn't put dorsal pressure or cause a pressure ulcer, then I don't see sort of an issue, uh, an issue with that. Uh, but also a stack splint, even if it's slightly loose fitting, as long as it's not too loose fitting and holding them in uh, extension at the DIP would, um, uh, would still suffice. Fair enough, thank you. Great. Any other questions? So this was pretty much all of plastics in an hour, right? So uh, you now we're fully really qualified to consider ourselves plastic surgeons. <laughs> Can write the exam now. <laughs> Perfect. Right. Okay, well, if no one has any other questions, um, I, I thank Dr. Grant for uh, coming uh, today, as well as everyone uh, for staying a little bit over time.